You're tuned into More Living with Jim Brogan, broadcast live from the Brogan Financial Studios at News Talk 98.7, where old-fashioned values, expert knowledge, and genuine understanding come together to give you the retirement straight talk you deserve. Jim's a former National Advisor of the Year recipient and a financial educator, and he's here today to talk about how you can live out the best years of your life. Jim and the Brogan Financial Team have been helping retirees and pre-retirees across the Southeast for over 20 years in their pursuit of financial independence. You can reach them during the week at 865-862-6800. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn, because more living with Jim Brogan starts now. Coming to you, of course, from News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I hope you're having a great weekend as we kind of get deeper into the heart of football season. It's an exciting time of year. I want to tell you a story about two brothers. Both brothers retired at age 62. Both brothers retired with a million dollars. And both brothers uh needed to take 50000 a year from the million dollars in order to supplement their other income in retirement. And they both had the same investment plan, and it's kind of that classic traditional investment plan, 60% stocks and stock funds, 40% bond funds. Still can't tell you how much in today's world I see that 60-40 or 70-30 mix with a heavy reliance on bonds to hedge to hedge down markets in the stock market. So they both did the same thing. They retired at the same age, same amount of money, same income need, and same investment plan. Now, brother number one retired in 1962. Brother number two retired in 1965. So they had very different outcomes. Brother number two died a wealthy old man, left a significant estate to his family, um, excuse me, brother number one, brother number two that retired in 1965, ran out of money, financially destitute and broke in his early 80s. So what's the only difference in the two brothers? The only difference is the year that they retired. Everything else was exactly the same. Now, now why is that? Well, it had to do with the timing of when we see Bull market runs and when we see bear markets. You know, markets are unpredictable. They're volatile. I believe very firmly we are going to see more bear markets. We're also going to see more bull market runs. Well, brother number one retired in 1962, and there was a big run-up in the market in 63 and 64. Very bullish market conditions. And brother number one made a lot more money than he took out. Brother number two wasn't so fortunate There was no subsequent run-up in the market after he retired. And in the 70s was a very tough decade. We had we had the hyperinflation in the late 70s from the oil crisis. But then in 73 and 74, we had a bear market. So it was a double whammy. The bear market ate into brother number two's savings, and he had not built up his savings more because there was no run-up in the market right after he retired. And then the inflation of the late 70s just did him in because he had to increase that income for inflation. And so it didn't matter that the markets eventually came back. He had, he, he, he got his, his money got too low. You know, with your, when your million dollars goes to 500,000 and then your income need is skyrocketing because of inflation. And now instead of 50,000 a year, he needed to be drawn 70 or 75,000 a year and he's only got $500,000. You can see where that becomes a real problem. So what does this really mean for you and me? Uh, I think it's critically important to understand the, the, and it illustrates the, the importance of understanding the financial mountain of your life. You know, if you think about going up a mountain and going down a mountain and think about that as your life cycle in financial terms, when you're going up the mountain, those are your working years, you're saving and accumulating money, you're letting that money grow. Uh, you're actually taking advantage of market volatility when you're going up the mountain because when you make 
contributions to your 401k, for example, those are coming out every single paycheck. So, and then the employer match is also happening. So when you're doing regular systematic investing like that on a monthly or even a bi-month, you know, twice a month or week, bi-weekly basis, you take advantage of market volatility because when markets are inevitably down, yeah, your current balance is also going to be down. However, because you are continuing to invest every paycheck or every month systematically, however you do it, you are, are buying while those markets are down. And so when the market comes back, that money, you're, you're buying, you're, you're, you're getting in for cheaper. Your, 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 your cost per share, whether it's a mutual fund, a stock, or whatever, your cost per share is lower because you've been buying at a discount when the market was in the middle of a correction. And that is fundamentally important to understand is that when you systematically invest, you take advantage of market volatility. But that's when you're going up the mountain. Now, you get to the top of the mountain and you put your flag in the ground. You finally retired. And, but you still have to get down the mountain. And I'm going to use Mount Everest as a comparison here. You know, roughly 78%, almost 80% of the people that have died on Mount Everest, they did not die going up the mountain. They died coming down the mountain. It's much more treacherous coming down the mountain. Coming down the mountain is the income and withdrawal phase of your life. You're no longer saving and accumulating to the opposite. You're, you're, you're selling it and spending it. And it creates a whole new set of risks and complications. And the, the biggest thing that it does, or one of the biggest, is illustrated by these two brothers that got these very, very different outcomes. Because what happens in the early years of retirement has a disproportional effect on your long-term retirement outcome. You know, uh, think about it. If you have a big, if you realize a big hit to your investments, to your life savings in the first five to seven years of retirement, you know, if you retire at 65, you need to be prepared to be able to draw income for 25 to 30 years. And if you have a big hit to that money early on, then that can be devastating. So ultimately, it comes down to market timing. The only two, the only difference in these two brothers was their market timing. Brother number one happened to retire right before a bull market run. Brother number two wasn't so fortunate. He retired. Market kind of crept along, wasn't in a bear market. It, it, you know, market was just kind of creeping along. And then the 70s was a very def- difficult decade. So the problem is we don't, we, we can't control our market timing. I mean, just look at the last couple of years. I mean, Last fall, about a year ago, a little, little less than a year ago, who would have thought that we would have had the type of stock market rally we have seen since the end of October? It's been remarkable. And, yeah, we've had, you know, this, this wasn't a great week in the market. September, historically, has been the worst month in the stock market, historically. Now, that doesn't mean it'll end up being the worst month this year. You know, you can never time those things, but we never know what's coming next. And the problem is, you know, I talked about how you take, take, you're able to take advantage of market volatility when you're saving and investing money because when markets are down, you're buying more shares at a cheaper price and you benefit when the market recovers. Well, the opposite happens when you're taking money out. You know, when you're taking money out, when markets are, are down and we're in a correction, you still need your income. And so if you have to then sell shares of an investment in order to spend that money for income, you're selling it while it's down, it, which is the opposite of the benefit of buying things are down, right? But, you're, but you have to because you need income. And so then you're going to compound your loss. That money will never, ever come back because it's been spent. So understanding market timing risk, the the, the correct phrase for that is sequence of return risk. 
you know, we know over 20, 30 year period, the markets do well and, and, and have historically been the best way to protect against inflation, especially for retirement income. The problem is in the short term, it's completely unpredictable. And we don't know what we're going to get year to year. So you need a plan that can mitigate that risk so that if the markets are bad in those first five, six, seven years of retirement, it's not devastating to you. So how can you mitigate the risk when are the good years in the market and when are the bad years in the market? See, when you're saving and accumulating money, that's not nearly as important. But when you're, spe- you're selling and withdrawing and spending money, it becomes critically important. And we don't, but the bottom line is we don't want to be selling shares of an investment when they're sharply down, whether it's a mutual fund or a stock or an ETF. That's what we do not want to be doing. That's kind of rule number one in wealth management. Don't spend a significant investment loss. It's okay to sell something when it's down and reinvest it but you never want to sell it and spend it. So you need a plan to mitigate that risk in the short term, in the the next, say, six, seven years. You could almost even say the first decade. So how do you create a plan that can mitigate that risk? We don't know our market timing when we retire. I certainly don't want markets to dictate when I retire. Do you want markets to dictate when you're able to retire? You know, what happens if there's a bear market right before you want to retire? What happens if you retire and then there's a bear market right out of the gate and you feel like you have to go back to work? The market should not be dictating your retirement success. However, the market, in reality, is the best way to fight inflation and have your income grow over time. So when we come back, I'm going to talk about how to mitigate this risk, how to structure income to mitigate the short-term risk of volatile stock markets. So stay with us. This is Jim Brogan. You're listening to More Living right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back. This is More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. We're with you every Saturday on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. We're we're with you every Saturday, 9 to 10 a.m., and again from 3 to 4 p.m. You can also catch all of our show's podcast. You can either go to my website at broganfinancial.com and click on radio, or uh, you can go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and type in More Living. Uh, with Jim Brogan. Today we're talking about understanding mark, the, the, the market timing risk that becomes a new threat, a new risk to your money when you get very close to retirement and then in the first few years of retirement. Specifically, when are the good years in the market and when are the bad years? Because, you know, we know, and I'm going to talk about later in this show, that the best way to fight inflation long term and historically has been the stock market. Uh, but the problem is in the short term is completely unpredictable and it's very volatile potentially. And we can't control that volatility and having a big hit, realizing big losses to your money in the early years of retirement can be devastating. It's called sequence of returns risk. You know, one of the biggest ha- hedges Maybe the best hedge against market volatility is time. Time in the market. You've heard me talk about that. Time in the market, not timing of the market. Who'd have thought in October of last year we were going to see the kind of bull market run we've seen since the end of October last year? But you have to be in the market when we have those runs, and they sometimes are very unexpected. But that means we're going to be in the market when we see the busts. So how do you mitigate this risk? When you convert into retirement and you have to start withdrawing and spending money, because as I mentioned in that first segment, you do not want to be selling shares of a stock, a mutual fund, an ETF when they are sharply down, not to spend the money. It's okay to sell and reinvest, but don't sell and spend it because that's what really, really could be devastating in retirement, especially early on. So how do you mitigate this risk? 
in my view, the best way is how to, is, it deals with how you structure your retirement income. You know, the, you know, you really shouldn't be living on risk at risk investments like stocks, mutual funds, ETFs that are in this market. You really shouldn't be relying on those things for short term income. Now, let me clarify that. You know, if you receive, you know, if you have stocks or, or a stock fund and you're receiving dividends, you know, you're getting a dividend yield. One of the benefits of dividend yielding stocks is that when the stock price is down, a good healthy company is going to keep paying their dividend. Um, and, and so the, the key is you're not selling shares of that stock when it's down. But if it's maintaining its dividend, you're, 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 you know, you're, you're getting your dividend, but then you're not selling shares. So it's okay to include dividends in your income plan. So when I say don't live off of the risk investments, I'm saying don't have to sell shares. Now, I'm also not a proponent of therefore going out and saying I've got to find a stock portfolio that can yield three or four percent or four and a half percent dividends because then you're going to really shrink the options available to you in the stock market. And while I'm a fan of dividend yielding stocks, especially companies that have increased their dividend every year for a long time, that shows tremendous financial stability in, in a company's profits. While I am a fan of those types of companies, I also don't want to eliminate picking stocks that don't have a three or four percent dividend yield. Because there's some great stocks out there. And what we're after is total return, which is, which is dividend plus price appreciation or depreciation. You know, we're after total return. So when I say don't be living on the risk assets, I'm saying don't be selling shares. And the flip side, as I say, is I don't want to have to focus on I have to have three, four percent dividend yield. So what this means is when I, when I invest risk assets, I need, I need some time on my side. I need to know that I've got a, 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 some time of at least a few years to be able to ride through a bad market. So that means I don't have to depend on selling off those shares of investment when the market is sharply down. So that means I'm going to have more protected and stable holdings that I can draw from in the short term. And that would be you know, it could be things that are guaranteed principal, and you've got to look at who's backing the guarantee. That could be things like CDs, treasury bonds, even some short-term bond alternatives. Um, there are guaranteed interest contracts, which are like CDs, but they're with insurance companies. The, 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 the bottom line is they're not in the stock market, and they're much, much more stable or even guaranteed principal, and you can depend on that money in the short term. Now the problem with those types of holdings is in the long term, they just don't, they have a difficult time keeping up with inflation. So you structure those more safe and protected and stable holdings to provide for short term income. And then you, and then it, if and, well, when the market is sharply down, that's what you draw your income from. It's okay to sell investments when they're up and generate income, but we don't want to sell when they're down and generate income. So you need to have some safe money. And, you know, I hear, it's kind of funny, I hear a lot of people say, oh, I need two years of safe money, you know, that I can ride through a bear market. Well, that that's not enough. I mean, you, you in my view, need a minimum of four to five years. And to really have a more secure financial plan, I think it's ideal to have six or seven or even you know, at least six or seven years, but the minimum would be four to five years of safe money that you could pull from. So that, that means if you need to draw 30000 a year from your investments, from your life savings, and, and you're retiring next month, well, 30000 a year times five years is you need 150000 of safe assets so that you're not, you know that you can pull from those if we go through a major market downturn. So how you structure retirement income is so important. Now, there are other approaches to retirement income. What I'm talking about is what I call and we call a bucket approach. You have a safe money bucket that you structure for short-term income, and then you have your risk bucket is for long-term growth for future income to fight inflation. 
But there are other ways to do it. And another way to do it would be kind of a total return approach. And this is the type of an approach you'll see with endowments and foundations. You know, somebody wants to be able to take a 4 to 5% return, and they want to be able to do that every year. And that, that can be an approach to retirement income. The, my concern with that is that means when markets are sharply down, you're not going to be able to draw as much income. Because four, four and a half, five, whatever the income amount is, when it's down, you're not going to be able to spend as much. And, you know, I don't know about you, but most people I talk to that are most of our clients and most people that come into our office, they don't want markets dictating their retirement lifestyle. And the last thing you want to be doing is curtailing your, your lifestyle in the early years of retirement when you're going to want to do more discretionary spending while you're healthy and, and can get around and you're more mobile and can do more things. So th- that can be managed, but it also creates some risk to income. So I just think you have to be, you know, very careful about how to structure retirement income. Now, some of it, too, depends on how much retirement income you need. You know, what is the amount of income you need to pull from your savings every year? And and, and, and how big is that compared to your life savings? Is it 2%? Is it 3%? Is it 4%? Is it 1%? That makes an impact, too. You know, if you need to draw out 35 4% starting in year one, You've got to have more protected income in those early years. But, you know, if you're drawing 1% or 2%, a market downturn, it's still a risk. Mark, sequence of returns, market timing is still a risk, but it's not nearly as big a risk. So it's just understanding how to put together your retirement income. You know, that's the crucial thing. I think retirement, in, in, in retirement, income planning is the most overlooked area in, 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 in retirement planning. Because the, the traditional way is to use that total return approach. But then if you're having to sell investments when they're down, significantly down to generate income, it can be catastrophic as it was with the two brothers example I gave early in the show. So that's the best way to mitigate the risk of a challenging bear market in the first five years of retirement or, say, a, 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 a mediocre, you know, sideways decade in the first year of retirement. Because we just don't know what's going to happen, and we don't want the market to dictate whether we're successful or not. Now, the flip side is those those stable and and protected holdings that you can draw from that are predictable in the short term, in the long term, they really perform, they really cause a drag on your performance and are not effective at beating inflation. And one of the biggest culprits to that is bond funds. Bond mutual funds and bond ETFs, I mean, bonds historically have been a way to hedge stock market risk. So the idea is if the stock market is sharply down, Bonds are, you know, up a little bit. The last five years, that has not turned out to be as true as previously thought. Uh, plus, stocks are more volatile than bonds. And so if you have a 60-40 portfolio and stocks are sharply down, bonds are not going to be up the way stocks are down. And, and so you're still going to see, you know, a pretty big stock market loss with a 60-40 or 70-30 mix. So how can you be, so so the heavy reliance on bond funds to hedge risk is dangerous. And then you don't want too much money. I mean, we we like safety and protection, but we also have got to fight inflation in what may be a 25 or 30 year lifetime. So how do we protect our income against inflation over the entirety of our retirement life? We'll cover that in the next segment, so stay with us. This is More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Thank you for tuning in this week for Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. We're talking about 
uh, many of the of the challenges that we face in retirement with structuring retirement income um, and not being a victim of sequence of return risk. In other words, you retire and there's immediately either in the first five years either a substantial bear market or maybe we have a mediocre decade that's choppy in the stock market. And unfortunately, if you're depending on market investments for, for short-term income, I mean, we in the short-term markets are completely unpredictable. But then the, the flip side of that is how do we fight inflation long-term? You know, that's one of the biggest risks to your retirement is inflation. I would say over the entirety of your retirement, it's maybe just as big a risk of losing a lot of money in stock market decline. Uh, and I think people are feeling that more and more now with some of the inflation challenges we've had the last couple of years. Now, I don't believe inflation is going to be at 4 and 5% in the coming decade. It's already at 29 I, I know you know, it doesn't feel like 2.9 because that 2.9 is on top of our previous inflation. So prices are not coming down. They're still going up. So there's a new baseline. But in terms of prices moving forward, you know, we just have to be aware that 25 percent inflation uh, is something that's a big threat to your retirement income. So how do you fight that battle? Well, over time... The number one way to fight inflation is risk-based stock market investing. And that's been historically the truth. That doesn't mean it's guaranteed to be that way in the future. We never know. But I do believe that is the best way to fight inflation over time. Now, what about in short periods of time? I get asked this a lot, a lot when, when we're in an inflationary environment. Should I buy more gold? You know, or what, what are some other things I should do to try to inflate, to fight inflation? And the reality is, is gold sometimes, gold and silver, precious metals, are they sometimes an effective hedge against inflation? In the short term, yes, they can be, but they aren't always that. But there are other ways to hedge inflation. And, but, but that's in the short term. The, the, the real, I'm sorry, other ways to, yeah, yeah, hedge inflation in the short term. But that's in the short term. And in the long term, the reality is gold over, over longer periods of time has really not been a tremendously fruitful investment. But it has periods of time where it can be an effective hedge. Uh, the problem is, just like bonds, which are sometimes used to hedge, often used, mostly used by, by most, to hedge market risk, over time it, it is likely to produce a drag on your on your investment. So that doesn't mean you don't have anything in, in bonds or in other hedges for inflation. Precious metals, commodities, energy can be hedges. Um, but those things are probably going to pull down performance over time. And so... You know, if you want to lose less when the market is down, then you're going to have to have a, a more diversified portfolio that is not, that is then not going to make as much when market booms. And we have to understand fundamentally the relationship of risk and reward. You know, we can't have the, the upside reward potential of being fully invested all in stocks, but not have the downside that goes with it. So when we, invest in other asset classes to hedge that downside risk, we're not going to make as much in a boom. So we fundamentally have to understand that. So the stock piece of the portfolio is what over time is likely to deliver your biggest opportunity to beat inflation. So what we want to do is we want to have a portfolio that can have more equities, and less bond exposure, but yet risk neutral. So if we get, in other words, does not increase risk. So how do you do that? You, you have greater levels of diversification. Instead of loading up with bond funds, you have some other asset classes. And, and the idea is you're adding things that if one thing zigs, another zags. So if one thing's way down, hopefully, you know, like stocks, hopefully they're not all way down. 
and you're using more tools than just bonds so that you can have more upside potential. And I'll, I'll kind of give an example there. Um, you know, real estate. Real estate is not closely, it is correlated to the stock market, but not as closely correlated as you might think. So it's having a little bit of a lot of different things, but the stock market exposure, having diversified stock market exposure, which means large cap and small companies in the U.S., it means international stocks, but being very diversified in the stock market historically has been the best way to beat inflation. You just don't want that heavy, heavy, that 35, 40% loss in the short term. But we don't want the weight. It is, it's like shackles around your ankles, the more bond funds that you have in your portfolio. So the idea is we add more of these other kinds of things. And if you really look at what can happen economically, because I believe it's completely unpredictable if we look forward. Um, you know, there's really, if we look at the economy, there's really only four things that can happen to various degrees in the economy. We can have economic expansion or contraction and everything in between. And we have inflation or deflation and everything in between. That's it. Uh, and I fundamentally believe we don't know when one of those things is going to end and the next one's going to begin. We just never know. It's unpredictable. There could be an event. We never know if there's something lying under the surface that we don't see that could cause us to go into a bear market. So the idea is we own, instead of owning three or four things like large cap stocks, international stocks, small cap stocks, and a heavy mixture of bond funds, maybe you've got more like nine or ten things. And we include some of these other things I'm talking about. Real estate investment. Uh, commodities, natural resources, energy, um, those kinds of things. Then you've got more types of holdings, and the idea is when markets are down, regardless of the economic reason of why they are down, there are some positions, you've got three or four things that are doing pretty well or even making money. The problem is we never know which of those things we're going to need in order to hedge that downside. So we need more stuff. And, and by the way, one of the, one of the best diversification tools is to own volatility. You know, if you own, if you, without getting too complicated of how to do that, the idea, you know, is conceptually is when markets are sharply down, you have a small piece of your portfolio that makes a good bit of money. And then that helps hedge some of the other holdings. Now, you don't want too much in something like that, but it can be an effective, and hedging is a good word, okay? We, but we want to be careful we don't have too much hedging because in the long run, stocks are going to give us the best. Again, a diversified stock portfolio has always given us a better opportunity to beat inflation over a 20- or 30-year retirement. Uh, and so, again, it doesn't mean it's guaranteed to in the future, but I believe very strongly it will. So it's coming up with that right mix of assets where you've got the right kind of diversification and you can hopefully have more stock exposure and less bond exposure without giving up risk or, or really, with, yeah, with, or excuse me, without taking more risk. So if you look at that traditional 60-40 portfolio, Maybe you can have more in stock funds and then more in other kinds of things like real estate and a few other things and then less in bonds, but not be taking on more risk of the, the big loss in the market downturn. Now, as you know, we, we can't ever predict the future. There's no certainty when you invest in things that take risk and don't have guaranteed principle. So, I, you know, I have to qualify that. But the bottom line is we, we can be very effective if we structure, going back to all three of these segments I've done today, if we structure retirement income in the short term to come from our safe and stable holdings, uh, because we, we know we cannot depend on the stock market in the short term, and instead let the market money grow for a minimum of five years, if not longer, before we would have to depend on it, we can invest more in equities and less in bonds and less in CDs 
and we can get more growth to fight inflation with an acceptable level of risk. Now, ultimately, we've got to be able to measure that risk so that you can have an idea how much are you hedging risk. If, if we had a 40% downturn, how much would you expect to lose? We can stress test. We have tools now where we can stress test of any portfolio and look at, like if we were to repeat a 2008 where the market lost 30, almost 37% one year. What would we expect to happen with a portfolio? And it's not a predictor. We can't guarantee it. And it's not, um, you know, you can always get variance in the result, but you can have a rough idea of what to expect so that you, you can be fairly comfortable with the level of risk you're taking. But then we can also look at, well, what will happen in a bull market? You know, if we repeated a 2013 when the market was up 32 percent, I mean, if you don't have the same downside exposure, you're not going to make as much. Well, how much? can you expect to make? And we can test that and measure it and then adjust and manage that over time. So it's very, very important in how you put your planning together. You know, I think these three segments today on the radio show are as important as anything I talk about in retirement planning is how to structure income to, to uh, mitigate the risk of a challenging stock market in the first five to 10 years of retirement but then how can you still grow your income for the long term to beat inflation? Uh, before I leave that topic, I do want to mention one more thing. Sometimes people, I hear people say, well, Jim, in 10 or 15 years, I'm not too as worried about inflation because I'm not going to be spending as much money. Um, you're, you're, when, we, when we look at in, retirement income and spending and we look at studies and do research, we see the retirement income smile. Your income just gradually decreases for a while in retirement. It doesn't just drop off a cliff. It just steadily decreases, but then late in life, it goes back up. So think of a smile, retirement smile. And that's because of the increased cost of health coverage. So your expenses just kind of shift. So don't assume you don't need to worry about inflation when you're 85. You absolutely need to be worried about inflation when you're 85. And in, as I say, inflation, in my view, for people retiring with longevity of life today is just as big of a risk to your success or failure in retirement as losing a lot of money in a market downturn in the short term. So, we, but, but they're both critical risks that we have to mitigate, and this is how we mitigate them, how we structure retirement income and how we hedge risk uh, to be able to hopefully add equities in the portfolio, have less bond funds, uh, while still being effectively hedged, be risk neutral. Now, we're going to get to our last break, and when we come back, I do want to talk about minimizing taxes, and I specifically want to talk about understanding investment taxation and the difference in investment taxation and taxes on ordinary income and really understanding how to take advantage of our tax code. So stay with us. This is More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back to More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I'm Jim Brogan. And I do want to mention we've been talking about really maybe the most critical topics in retirement planning today. Uh, one is understanding how to mitigate the risk of a challenging stock market in the early years of retirement, which we cannot control. And the risk of that is so much more vast than before you retire because you're withdrawing and spending money. But then also being able to fight inflation in the long term and understanding that the stock market historically and being in a diversified Stock market-based portfolio has been the best way to fight inflation in the long haul, but you've got to, you know, how do you mitigate the risk of short-term loss? I do want to say, you know, I've got an upcoming class on in October. It's on the 15th and the 22nd at Pellissippi State at Hardin Valley. Uh, I know that's a couple, uh, well, uh, that's just a month away. Hard to believe we're already into the second weekend of September. But yeah, it's October 15th and 22nd. It's a two-night class, Thrive Financially in Retirement. And in those two nights, 
I cover these topics I've covered today in more detail, and I cover a whole bunch of other stuff. So the whole goal in that class is to cover the seven key areas that I think all retirees and soon-to-be retirees need to be addressing in their planning to be to give yourself the greatest chance of being successful. What is success? you got to define that. Most people would say being able to draw the income they want, to do the things they want to do, not run out of money, and then maybe you also have a goal of leaving behind a nice legacy for your family. But whatever that goal is, I'm going to talk about the seven main ways to, to, to accomplish that goal. So again, that's uh, Tuesdays, October 15th and 22nd, uh, and it's 6.30 p.m. at Hardin Valley. Uh, you can go to PellissippiRetirementPlanning.com, uh, and you can find out more information. PellissippiRetirementPlanning.com, two sessions, Tuesdays, October 15th and 22nd, 6.30 p.m. both nights. I do want to talk for a minute about understanding investment taxation, and it, it's just so important to understand the differences in investment taxation and traditional income tax. You know, that when we draw income on our on our salaries, you know, that's traditional. That's subject to ordinary income tax. Uh, when we take a distribution from a four hundred one k or an IRA, it is subject to income tax, ordinary income. Uh, Social Security income is subject potentially to ordinary income tax and taxed at different levels depending on how much other income you have on your tax return. But investment taxation works differently. Now, the one exception is short-term capital gains. A short-term capital gain is if you buy an investment and sell it within a year. Short-term gains are taxed the same as ordinary income. But long-term gains are not. Long-term capital gains have preferential tax treatment. Now, interest, dividend income, typically is taxed as ordinary income as well. And that's investment taxation too. But long-term capital gains kind of are in their own category. And they're far better tax rates than ordinary income. So one thing that we try to really focus on with effective wealth management, and this is for pre people not retired or retired, how do you structure yourself to be able to take advantage of long-term capital gains? You know, we have a 0% long-term capital gains rate. A married couple today, if you're um, over 65 and have that extra deduction on your standard deduction, you know, you can make close to $130,000 of income, and, and any piece of that that's capital gains income, long-term gains, is taxed at a 0% rate, which is unbelievable. And by the way, a long-term capital gain, by definition, means you own an investment for more than one year. So it has to be one year plus a day, okay? But what a great incentive for investment, and that's why Congress put that in the Internal Revenue Code, is to incentivize investments. Well, even once you get above that 125, 130,000, and, and if you're not 65, that number is still over 125. That's still a big number. Uh, so then, after you get above those numbers, any part that's capital gains is taxed at 15 percent. Well, you know, the ordinary income tax rate when you're at those levels is 22% and then goes to 24 and then goes to 32, whereas the long-term capital gain rate is at 15. So I would much rather 10, 15 years from now be able to take advantage of a capital gain from a tax perspective rather than ordinary income. Well, that means I need to structure some investments that can take advantage of capital gains, right? Um, you know, when I own a an IRA or a 401k, I don't get long-term capital gains treatment. So I've got to build up long-term capital assets in my non-IRA portfolio. Thank you for tuning in this week. We've discussed your wealth because greater wealth provides for more living. 
so you can live the best years of your life your way. Thank you to Wayne for uh, engineering the show. Thank you to Jill for helping produce the show. Have a great weekend. This is More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. The views expressed by Jim Brogan and his guests are not that of Cumulus Media. Any discussion of financial, legal, and tax planning strategies is not intended to be individualized advice and is general in nature. Always consult with your advisor for advice specific to your needs. This program's content does not represent a recommendation of any particular security, strategy, or investment by Jim Brogan or Brogan Financial Incorporated.